This is Ham College, episode 9 for September 30th, 2015. This episode of Ham College is brought to you by ICOM, making DX local. And by hamstudy.org, a great place to study for your amateur license exam. College episode nine. I'm George. I'm Tommy. And we're going to have another good show. We always oh, do. We always do. Tonight we, uh, we're we going to talk, a, well, a number of different things though, but the technical topic is going to be that good friend of ours, the resistor. Yeah, the resistor. Resistance is futile. That's what they say. Yeah, that's what they say. I, I wish I had the shirt. There's a t-shirt with that on it. Yeah. I saw a bunch of them running around at the Ham Fest in Dayton, and uh, actually in Huntsville, too. And somebody posts, posts that on our uh, Facebook groups every now and then, too. Well, this is your perfect opportunity to get it out of the closet and wear it. <laughs> <laughs> couldn't be a more appropriate time. No, it really couldn't, could it? Well, you know, any time that uh, we're streaming live, and that's what we're doing here tonight... We're going to have a chat room going on. It's amateurlogic.tv slash chat. There's some of you in there now, cutting up, having a big time. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what we did last month, Tommy. Do you remember what we did? Did we do something last month? Yeah. We yeah, did. we've wrapped up frequencies. We did. We talked a little bit about uh, the band plan, and we showed a band plan chart there. This particular one's from ARRL. Uh, ICOM has got a good one as well. And you can probably find uh, several others on the internet. Yeah. Uh, also, we talked about repeaters. Yeah. <laughs> See, we talked about something else besides just that. Well, we did. What, what we did is we looked at some radios. We looked at some VHF, UHF, and uh, HF radios and talked about some of the bands on them. That blue one right there, that's my handy talkie. You've got one just like that, except it's not blue. Yeah, I've got the original ID51. And then that radio behind us there, we're going to look at it a little later. We're giving that one away over on Amateur Logic. Yeah, a couple of weeks, somebody's going to win that thing. Yeah. If uh, if you're already a ham and you got a call sign, then you can register for that. Go to amateurlogic.tv slash contest and register there. If you're still studying and you don't have your ticket yet, well, you've got... I don't know. Maybe if you in the next week or so, if you can take and pass your exam, then you'll have a call sign you can go register to. Yeah. But uh, we we can only give it away to a licensed amateur there. So sorry uh, that that we can't include everyone. But hey, there's your incentive. Yeah, absolutely. And then there are a lot of licenses. Even though this is aimed, this show is aimed at getting people licensed. There's still a lot of licensed hams that watch it. So, oh yeah, you know, if you haven't registered, get over there and, and uh, might want to get that done pretty quick. Yep, yep. Uh, let's see. We moved, we last week, last month we uh, we finished up the whole frequency section of the test pool. We did. So we're moving on to some new material this time. Uh, some of those. The, the frequency stuff is great stuff to know, um, but it seemed kind of long. So yeah, anyway, it, it's going it to be kind of nice to move on to some new material. And it's a little bit, some of it you just got to remember the answer yeah. to or really buckle down and study. Cause yeah, it, a lot of memorization type stuff. Yeah. But, well, what are we going to talk about? I know we don't have a history lesson this time around, but you do have a topic there that we're going to cover this yeah. month. Yeah, we're going to just kind of have a review on resistors. Yeah? Is it, have we talked about them before? Yeah, we did. Okay. We kind of briefly touched on them, but we didn't go into a lot of de detail on it. Well, let's go into a lot of detail. <clears throat> oh, why don't we? <laughs> <laughs> or, or just enough detail, just the right balance. Okay. A resistor limits the electrical current that flows through a circuit. Resistance is the restriction of current. 
In a resistor, the energy of electrons that pass through the resistor are changed to heat and or light. For example, in a light bulb, there's a resistor made of tungsten which converts electrons into light. That's also called the filament. Resistors are rated by the value of their resistance in ohms and the electrical power they can safely dissipate based upon the size and that's measured in watts. Now, let me say something here. Mm -hmm. you, we were looking at that light bulb right there. I just wanted to mention something about that. Yeah, that is like a resistor. Mm -hmm. and, and you can see the energy being dissipated and going out as light and heat. One thing about that resistor right there, though, that um, is not typical of, say, the carbon resistors that we use on a light bulb. If you measure the resistance, um, just, just the bulb sitting there, you get one reading. If you could measure that resistance when you had it cranked up and putting out heat there, the resistance is different. Oh yeah, It's not the same anymore. So people have used light bulbs for dummy loads before to connect their uh, ham rigs to, to have somewhere for the energy to go during testing. It's kind of hit and miss getting just the right values there to, to equal 50 ohms. Yeah, I've, I've heard of people doing that before, but I think I'd be a little bit scared to try it myself. Yeah, uh, it's... Um, Oh, you can do it. I mean, it used to be common practice. And you could look at that bulb and how bright it was, and you'd know if you had your rig tuned. Oh, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> well, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, that's okay. Did, that's interesting but, stuff. That's what, that's what we're here for. Okay. Okay. I'll do it again. <laughs> okay, no problem. <laughs> anyway, the power is either dissipated into the air off the surface of the resistor or by using a heat sink which actually does it the same way, it's just more surface generally. There's a heat sink resistor there. Right. Now what that did is it uh, allowed us to get a lot more power out of the same element, or same size element that's in right. there. Right. Yeah, that's kind of how uh, dummy load works as well. Yeah, they generally have something to sink some, off some, some of the heat. Yeah, some oil or something like that mm -hmm. in there, or uh, a lot of surface area, yeah. some fans. Okay. So anyway, there are a wide variety of resistors. They're all made with resistance material encased in a non-conductive or insulating casing made of plastic or something similar. Uh, fixed value resistors are usually made of carbon encased in plastic with a connecting wire on either end. Most resistors used in electronics today are carbon-based resistors. Some of the types of resistors are, are carbon composite, carbon pile, carbon film, printed carbon, thick film, thin film, metal film, metal oxide film, wire wound, foil resistors, ammeter shunts, grid resistor, variable resistors, and there's even more than that. That's a lot of resistance. Well, I just kind of like had a Forrest Gump <laughs> flashback there. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a, a number of different uh, styles of resistors there. That's not all there are, though. That's just... Oh, but not even close. Not even close. There's a lot of other types out there as well. Now, when the ones that... Uh, well, let's look again. The ones that are on the left there have got some colors on them. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. The resistor values are, are rated by the colors on the side of the resistor. The colors used in it are black, brown, red, orange, yellow, green, purple, gray, and white. Each color represents a different number. The black band represents the number zero, the brown band represents the number one, red is two, and so on, all the way to white, which is number nine. These numbers are very important because the understanding of them can tell you the value of the resistor. It's most common for resistors to have four colors, but they can range all the way up to six per resistor. On a four band resistor, the last band is gold or silver. The gold band represents a positive or negative 5% tolerance. The silver band on the resistor represents a positive or negative 10% tolerance. Hold this band on the right side and read the colors from left to right. The first two bands are read as the numbers that they represent in the color code. The third band acts as a multiplier for the other bands. And that's all I have to say about that. Well, to go on with the Forrest Gump theme. Yep. <clears throat> yep. Well, I, I got something we can say about that. Okay. 
We can talk about uh, the schematic symbols for a resistor. Okay. We've got those here. The, the top one there is what a resistor would look like on a schematic. The next one is a variable resistor called a rheostat. You can see on the left hand side we've got one leg there and then we've got the wiper in the center there that's the other lead and that'll be the the two leads for the resistor and as you move that wiper back and forth you're changing the value of the resistance. Mm -hmm. All right the bottom one is the same thing except it's got a third terminal on the opposite end it's actually like a resistor with the center tap that we can move back and forth over the resistor and we can dial in different amounts of resistance by doing that and we're going to take a look at some of that a little bit later here we're going to pull out some meters and some resistors and potentiometers and have a big old time oh awesome yeah so uh so resistors we know what that's basically for the the potentiometer and the rheostat what would be the different uses for each of those typical uses typical uses well something you might see it in oh uh, boy you could see those in a lot of things a potentiometer would be used a lot as a volume control right. um, a rheostat those are a little less common where would you see a rheostat well, i'm thinking though a light dimmer switch maybe wouldn't that be? Uh, you could dim a light with the rheostat, but normally those are done with um, uh, SCRs or something these days. But but yeah, um, you know, I just have never have seen a whole lot of rheostats in my life. Okay, I've but seen they, a few. But the elusive rheostat does exist. It does exist in the wild. It's in the wild. Okay. Yes, it's kind of on the endangered <laughs> species list. Okay. But they are out there, and I'm sure that. Uh, Somebody's going to say something about it in the chat room here. It's some rheostat application we obviously yeah, overlooked. I'm sure there's a rheostat expert in there. Yeah. How do you know which is left or right side to start reading the bands? Well, the the right side is always going to, on, we're talking about on the color code mm -hmm. now. The right side is generally always going to be either silver or gold. Yeah. And silver or gold will never be on the first three bands right so that, that's how you know it's oriented in the right direction mm -hmm. I did notice one thing though if we back up and look at that color code uh, this particular chart right here shows that a red could also be used there as well red is two yep that would be kind of unusual though I don't ever recall seeing uh, red anyway commonly it's going to be silver or gold if you got a resistor that's only got three bands on it that's going to be hard to figure out which end to now, start from. Um, Oh, it's pretty, it's, yeah, it's pretty easy. Just get your own meter out and check it. There you go. There you go. No that's problem solved. And if you're half colorblind like I am, that's a handy tool as well. Yeah. And uh, Tom in the chat room here said, when you got three bands, the band closest to the edge of the resistor is the left. And yeah, I, w I was going to say that. For some reason, I didn't. No, seriously, I was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, I was. I was okay. going to say that, but... I kind no, of way to go distracted. then. Way to go then. Yeah. I looked up and I saw the battery there and it just kind of <laughs> distracted me. Okay. Mark the three color bands usually clustered toward one end. Um, yeah. They 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 are, if it's only three on there, yeah, they're gonna generally be toward one end of that resistor. You don't see a lot of them with three bands, but you'll occasionally run across one. These new ones though, that's got like six bands on them. Man, those are Oh, wow. Yeah, that's really when you need to pull that meter out. Yeah, no kidding. Because generally, those are so small, I can't even read them with these, you know. Get yeah. A magnifier out and go after them. Yeah, I well, like the pretty story. interesting stuff, though. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. And you do <laughs> want to know the resistor color code. And there is a, um, there's a way to remember that. Yeah, but it's not really a nice saying. No, it's not. It's not a nice so, thing. Uh, we're not so, going to say it. Okay, we'll skip past it. Okay. But if you do a search on Google for resistor color code yeah, memory, you'll, you'll, you'll find it. You'll find it. Well, we're going to be back in just a minute and uh, get on into some of our technician pool questions for tonight so that we can get on into our, our project here. Are you contest ready? Expand your band experience and check out ICOM for the best in HF. Once again, ICOM raises the bar with the IC7851. Radio features include 
a 1.2 kHz optimum roofing filter, new local oscillator design with improved phase noise, and several spectrum scope enhancements. The pattern of perfection continues with ICOM's IC7700. This radio features a spectrum waterfall display on an impressive 7-inch color LCD, digital voice recording to capture incoming and outgoing calls, and direct remote control operation with ICOM's RSBA1 software. For solid HF operation this season, try ICOM's IC7600. This rig offers advanced DSP technology and three IF roofing filters, dual watch on the same band, and LED backlighting on an ultra-wide 5.8-inch display. Make sure you visit ICOMAmerica slash amateur for more information on ICOM's complete line of amateur radio products. Tommy, we've got something to give away. We and do. We've been doing that the last <coughs> few episodes, and I think we'll probably do it again. What is that? We have got some ICOM swag. We've got an ICOM cap and a nice ICOM ham crew t-shirt. Okay. Well, there you go. If um, uh, the way we're, we're doing this, and we don't really require that you be a ham to win this, you just go to ham college at amateurlogic.tv. Or you could email that. Yes. You just email us at hamcollege.amateurlogic.tv <laughs> and just tell us who you are. Uh, there's uh, really no uh, other requirements. And, and what size shirt you wear. What size shirt you wear. Is a good requirement. If you are a ham, give us your call sign in there. If you're not, hey, just tell us, hey, I'm still studying. Yeah. And uh, you, you could win. As a matter of fact, we've got a winner for one for this month that we drew just before the show here. I just so happen to have a name right here. Well, who have we got this month? We've got uh, Anthony, K-E-0-C-E-J, from Missouri. Ah, from, is that Missouri? That's what I call her, is it Missouri? It depends on who you talk to. If you're in Missouri, it's Missouri. Okay. But since we're in Mississippi, it's Missouri. Okay. We're, not in, we're not in Mississippi. <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> no, you're you're right. You're uh -huh. right. Okay. Well, K E zero C E J. Anyway, congratulations, Anthony. All right. Good deal. I tell you what. Let's get on into these questions. And although I've gotten a little out of sequence here, we're going to have to set up for that. So we'll get through these questions, and then we'll. Uh, yeah, that'd be the good. Then we won't have to uh, rearrange everything twice. Well, Tommy, how are you feeling about the contest tonight? The questions and who's going to be. Oh, uh, you're going down, man. <laughs> That's all I got to okay. say. All right. <laughs> well, we'll see here. Just to show I'm a fair sport, I'm going to let you answer this first one, so I will read it. Okay. What is meant by the term PTT? A, pre-transmission tuning to reduce transmitter harmonic emission. B, precise tone transmissions used to limit repeater access to only certain signals. C, a primary transformer tuner. Let me try that again. C, a primary transformer tuner used to match antennas. Or D, the push to talk function, which switches between receive and transmit. Okay, so pre-transmission tuning, A, pre-transmission tuning, I don't even know what, to reduce transmitter harmonic, no. Precise tone transmissions, no. I just, and I can't even tell you why, but that's not it. I, I know I know what the answer is just because I've been a ham, but, I, but those don't even make sense to me. Okay. <laughs> then you probably wouldn't pick any of those. I wouldn't pick any of those, and I wouldn't pick C either. Primary transformer tuner to match antennas. Yeah, and that's, I just want to point this out. That's the reason I had to read that twice. A primary transformer tuner used to match antennas. It, shouldn't that be used, USED? Yep. Okay. I'm vindicated. Okay. Uh, or D, the push to talk function, which switches between receive and transmit, and that's going to be your answer for the million dollars, and that's my final answer. 
Well, let's see if you are correct. And you are. And, I, and I'm sitting here looking at these, trying to figure out how I can help somebody reason that out. And mm -hmm. I just don't see it. Do you have a, uh, any, uh, any input on how I to do. reason through those? I have a good reason, a good way you can reason that one out. If you think about a microphone and that button on the side, you push to talk. <laughs> PTT. Okay. All right. Some of them, well, if you look and... I was looking for something a little bit more <laughs> elaborate than that, but well, I'll take that. Some of them, if you look at the side, it says PTT <laughs> on that button. Okay? okay. That's as precise as I, I can get. I can't that. argue with that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's go on to the next one. Let's then. do. How might a computer be used as part of an amateur radio station? A, for logging contacts and contact information. B, for sending and or receiving CW. C, for generating and decoding digital signals. Or D, all of these choices are correct. And Tommy, that's going to be my answer right there is D. That's your, that's your final answer? That's my final answer on it because I know I can use a computer for logging contacts and uh, contact information. I mean, that that just oh, makes sense. Yes, I deal for that. I know that software that I can use for sending or receiving CW with because I've used it before. Yeah. Uh, you, there's also software you can use for a lot of different uh, modulation modes Yeah. Uh, using a computer. Um, and I know you can use it for generating and decoding digital signals. So it's got to be D, all of the above. And naturally, I am correct. You are correct. Okay. Well, with that, let's And I've done pretty much all of those. So. I pretty much have, too. I mean, a computer, a computer is like almost indispensable accessory in your ham shack nowadays. Well, it kind of is now. I mean, there was a while that probably hams were bad-mouthing computers pretty bad. Yeah. And we still do on occasion. We might swear at one, but... Uh, <laughs> on a daily basis. Yeah. But, yeah, it's... Uh, most hams have got a computer now. Yeah, it's a great I mean, addition. It's a great addition. Not required. Don't really have to have it, but it's, it's a good convenience. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll move on to the next one here. And this one, which type of modulation is most commonly used for VHF and UHF force repeaters? A, AM. B, SSB or single sideband. C, PSK. Or D, FM. And I have never heard anyone doing AM on VHF or UHF repeaters. I haven't heard it. Uh, it on the repeaters? I haven't heard it. Okay. I mean, you theoretically you could, but it just... No, I've I've never seen it. Yeah, so um I that I'm gonna go with D F M for that. So um I've never heard of anyone doing sideband single sideband on the repeaters. Now I do know of people using uh doing two meter single sideband. Mm -hmm. Talking pretty good, you know, a couple hundred miles with that, um, which is pretty good. And then uh no PSK on repeaters. Oh, fist bump. Yep. All right. For the next one, what type of modulation is most commonly used for VHF packet radio transmissions? A, FM, or frequency modulation? B, SSB, or that would be single sideband. C, AM, or amplitude modulation. Or D, spread spectrum. And that's and yours. That's mine. So I'm going to say just because I know... VHF packet radio transmissions are, they're generally always going to be FM. Yeah, I was going to look to see if everybody answered D again down in the chat room, but we didn't get them on that one. No, didn't get them on that one. And I'm correct. Give it up. All right. And the way I, I know that and the way that uh, maybe you could remember this is on VHF, the majority of the radios are FM radios. Mm -hmm. I mean, you you can have AM or single sideband or, I guess, even spread, can't say it, spread spectrum. But uh, just just all these, these handy talkies, these mobile rigs and all, they'll have FM on it. Some of them will have 
single sideband or maybe AM as a second modulation type, but that's pretty rare. You don't you don't see that very often. Yeah, you're starting to see uh, more digital voice stuff now. You are, yeah, but that wasn't one of the choices. No, it wasn't. Just saying. Yeah. Just saying. Yeah. And, and you correctly so. So is that FM or is that AM? It's or digital. Is that something else. It's digital. Digital. Okay. All right. Next question. What is a way to establish quick access to a favorite frequency on your transceiver? A. Enable the CTCSS tone. B. Store the frequency in a memory channel. C. Disable the CTCSS tone. Or D. Use the scan mode to select the desired frequency. And this is mine. And actually, when I when I read B, I almost put a duh after it. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, that's the only one that makes any sense. Quick access to your favorite frequency on your transceiver. So enabling the tone has nothing to do with that. No. Disabling the tone doesn't have anything to do with that. No. And, and using scan mode, that's certainly not going to be uh, quick access, although you could eventually find it there you could find all your favorite frequencies <laughs> at one time <laughs> yeah. so the answer is going to be bravo b and you're correct all right store the frequency in a memory channel yeah i've done that a time or two well, over the last 20 go, some odd years hmm? way to go oh yeah <laughs> okay i would say uh <clears throat> it's a uh, anybody's ball game at this point yeah pretty much tied up so let's go on to the next question this is this a tiebreaker? Yes. That, well, it could be. Okay. What is a good reason not to use a rubber duck antenna inside your car? I wish I had known about this when I first got my first radio. Yeah, I wish you would have too, because <laughs> yeah, I, I was trying to hear you. <laughs> <laughs> a. Signals can be significantly weaker than when it's outside of the vehicle. B. It might cause your radio to overheat. C, the SWR might decrease, decrease in the signal strength. Or D, all of these choices are correct. And I can tell you from experience that it's going to be A, alpha, because what my first radio was a handy talkie, and I rode around with it in the car, talk, trying to talk to you, and I remember many times, you got that mm -hmm. thing inside the car again? Yeah. <laughs> yep. Are you rubber You're duck? Right. Are you rubber duck mobile again? Yeah. So, yeah. So yeah. it's going to be a. And you're correct. Although that was my question to answer, I'll. I'll well, I couldn't I'll pass that one up, man. I know. I was. Good. What is another good reason uh, not to use a, a rubber duck antenna inside your car? Is you put your eye out with that thing, kid. <laughs> but no. Sorry, I didn't mean to take, you can take two in a row next time then. That's okay. Okay. That's okay. Well, let's move on to the next one. Yeah, and moving, moving right along. It's going to be, and wow, you, so you go ahead and read it so we're back on. <laughs> what is the disadvantage of a rubber duck antenna supplied with most handheld radio transceivers? A, it does not transmit or receive as effectively as a full-sized antenna. B, it transmits a circularly polarized signal. C, if the rubber and the cap is lost, it will unravel very quickly. If the rubber end cap is lost. In, okay, rubber end cap, yep. Or D, all of these choices are correct. Okay, and let's see, I will answer this one. What is the disadvantage of a rubber duck antenna supplied with most handheld radio transceivers? Well, Let's look at B there. It transmits a circularly polarized signal only if you move it really quick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which uh, I'm not sure we could move it that quick. C, if the rubber end cap is lost, it will unravel very quickly. No, nah, because I've had one that had no rubber end cap before, or it did get lost and it didn't unravel very quickly anyway. So it can't be D, all of these choices are correct, because I know two of them are not. So it's got to be A, it does not transmit or receive as efficiently as a full-size antenna. And I know that because of listening to you talk on a rubber duck antenna. 
In the car. In the car. Yep. Yep. So, there, take that. Next question, what device increases the low power output from a handheld transceiver? A, a voltage divider. <laughs> That's funny. B, an RF power amplifier. C, an impedance network. Or D, all of these choices are correct. Well, it's not a voltage divider. And it's an impedance network. That's not going to increase the output. It's going to be B, an RF power amplifier. Now, I'm trying to scan down through there and come up with another reason. But, uh, I mean, you want to increase the output power, so we're going to amplify it. So I guess that's the only way to really remember that. I, I think you're probably right on that. And we call those uh, typically linear amplifiers. Yeah. And why do we call it a linear amplifier? Because you said so. I don't know. <laughs> That's exactly correct. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, we call it a linear amplifier because whatever you put in it is uh, whatever you get out linearly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, say so yeah. that three times real yeah. fast. Well, I don't want to confuse you, so we'll just let it go with that. Moving right along? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> moving right along. And everybody... Uh, said B in there. Well, I think we had one A in there on that one. Um, oh, Mike said it's the high-low power switch. That wasn't one of your choices, though. No, it wasn't one of your choices. But it would work if you had, if that was a choice. All right, why don't you read the next one for us there? What determines the amount of deviation of an FM as opposed to PM signal? Both the frequency and amplitude of the modulating signal? B, the frequency of the mod. I can see it. B, the frequency of the modulating signal. C, the amplitude of the modulating signal. Or D, the relative phase of the modulation. Oh. Or D, the relative phase of the modulating signal and the carrier. Whose turn is it to answer? Yours. This? It's my turn to answer. What determines the amount of deviation of an FM as opposed to a PM signal? Do you even know what a PM signal is? No. Okay. Do that you? would be one that occurs at night. Yeah. Well, yeah. After, or after, afternoon. Afternoon. Yeah. Now, um, what determines the amount of deviation of an FM? All right. As opposed to anything, what de what always determines the deviation of an FM is going to be the amplitude of the modulating signal. That's going to be my answer. Let's see, both the frequency and amplitude of the modulating signal. Now, frequency um, is what's going to change, but what's going to change that frequency is the amplitude of the modulating signal. B, the frequency of the modulating signal. No, no doesn't change the amount of deviation. Uh, D, the relative phase of the modulating signal and the carrier. No, that's not it either. So I'm going to say C, Tommy. Yep. That's, that is correct. Now, for extra credit, because I'm sure this is for, for unlicensed hams, some of them may not know what deviation is. Deviation. Um, not to put you on the spot or anything. What I know you know what it is. is. I know what it is. Mm -hmm. um, all right, let's talk about the two most popular types of modulation. First, we'll talk about AM. That's amplitude modulation. The way that we get an intelligible signal on that carrier, first we generate a carrier frequency. Say, we're going to talk on uh, 146 megahertz. We've got an oscillator that makes us a 146 megahertz signal. If we amplitude modulate it for AM, we're going to be changing the strength of that signal up and down along with the um, amplitude of the voice or whatever mm -hmm. you're using to modulate it with. Right. So like on the oscilloscope last month when we showed the sine wave, the frequency is going to be the spacing between the waves. The amplitude is going to be the height of it. Right. So amplitude modulation, we're changing the, the strength of that signal or of that carrier. Frequency modulation, what we're doing is we're deviating the frequency. 
So you'll see those waves get closer and, and farther apart. They'll, they're going this way instead of going that way. Okay. Makes sense? It does. And by the way, PM up there stands for phase modulation, I think is probably what they meant, but uh, that really didn't have anything to do with... Uh, that oh, cool. Well, that was a good answer. little side uh, little detour we made there. Yep. Informative. Okay. Well, let's move on to the next one here. Okay. Let and turn. let's see. What is the appropriate bandwidth of a VHF repeater FM phone signal? A, less than 500 hertz. B, about 150 kilohertz. C, between 10 and 15 kilohertz. Or D, between 50 and 125 kilohertz. And I smiled because I was kind of glad that you drew this question. Well, I know the answer is C, between 10 and 15 kilohertz. Uh, you believe that's right. And that's uh, and I don't really know how to tell you to reason that out. That's just going to be one of those you're going to have to remember. Okay. Uh, is there, Unless you know a way to reason it out. But, uh, I mean, if that's just the answer, period. Yeah, well, I know 500 hertz is, is not going to be nearly enough uh, right. because you couldn't convey very much information that 150 kilohertz, that's going to be just super wide. I mean, an FM broadcast station um, is only 75 kilohertz, so we're not going to need twice that much to do voice on amateur radio. Uh, D there, between 50 and 125 kilohertz. Sounds like it could be potential, but look again, I said FM broadcast is only 75 kilohertz. So that leaves us with the obvious choice of 10 to 15 kilohertz. There you go. Just remember all that and you got it made. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I just yeah. happen to know about the uh -huh. FM broadcast yeah. thing, but I wouldn't think. Right. You typically know that. So let's see if we were right on that. We are. Cool. 10 to 15 kilohertz. All right. So we'll move on to the next one here. What happens when the deviation of an FM transmitter is increased? It's A, its signal occupies more bandwidth. B, its output power increases. C, its output power and bandwidth increases. Or D, uh, asymmetric modulation occurs. All right, this one is mine. What happens when the deviation of an FM transmitter is increased? Well, asymmetric modulation, I don't think that's got anything to do with it, so we can strike out D. Uh, C, it's output power and bandwidth increases. No, output power would increase on amplitude modulation. Mm -hmm. Not on frequency modulation, so I know that one's not it. B, it's output power increases. No, there again, output power increases with amplitude yeah, modulation. That only leaves one. Answer. That only leaves one. It, it's signal occupies more bandwidth, and the reason it does is because it's yeah from it's from the explanation frequency. you just gave us on yep. the previous question. So that kind of tied mm -hmm. right into here. Let's see if I'm right. I am, and right. so were. Most of the people in the chat room, there were some C's in there. Um, and that's kind of tricky. Yeah, it, it is. Yeah. I will, I will put it, it, if there was something wrong with your transmitter, maybe C could happen. Yeah. It, w it wouldn't be uh, the desired effect, and that's not normally what you'd see. But mm -hmm. uh, some defect in the transmitter might would cause that. <laughs> Let's pause here for a moment. And we'll get the rest of our slides loaded up. Are you new to the ham world or an existing amateur operator who wants to take your license to the next level? Study for your radio license exam at hamstudy.org. Hamstudy.org is a free online learning tool powered by ICOM. It was created by Richard Bateman, KD7BBC, Michael Stuffelbeam, KV9G, and Rich Porter, KK6GKE, and it uses a modern web design to enhance the experience of studying for your technician, general, and amateur extra exams. 
Since 2013, hamstudy.org has helped new and existing hams to familiarize themselves with the question pools, use stats-based flashcards to focus on material they need to learn, and take practice exams to gauge progress. Visit hamstudy.org on your desktop computer or mobile device. Register for a free account at hamstudy.org to access personalized study history and other site features. Prepare for an exam in an intuitive and comprehensive manner. Check out hamstudy.org powered by ICOM for free learning tools. Good luck on your next exam. By the way, where did you get that shirt? Well, it's fellow with the call sign VE3MIC sent a box with several of them. He did. Several shirts in them. So you got some too. I got some and, too. Uh, Peter got, got some too. Yeah. So I appreciate those, Mike. Yeah, thanks for, a lot. For the wardrobe. And I would be wearing one of them myself right now, but I can't find them. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure where they are, but they're around here somewhere. Next question. What electrical component is used to oppose the flow of current in a DC circuit? A, an inductor. B, a resistor. C, a voltmeter. Or D, a transformer. And... It's not an inductor. <laughs> it's it almost seems funny just to run down through these because of what we've been sitting here talking about the whole time. But yeah, um, it and it's not a voltmeter, and you know, that's a measurement device, and it's certainly not a transformer. I mean, it's just a resistor. Yeah, yeah, it's just a resistor. Transformer doesn't do anything to DC. I mean, it's works with AC. So I'm going to agree with you, Tommy. Uh, survey in the chat room says B, and we're all right. All right. Yep. Everybody. Everybody's correct. Everybody. Knuckle bump yourself. <laughs> okay. Okay. Next one. What type of component? Wait. Is it my turn or yours? Yeah. It's your turn to oh, read. Okay. What type of component is often used as an adjustable volume control? A, a fixed resistor. B, a power resistor. C, a potentiometer. Or D, a transformer. Yeah, we just discussed this about 15 minutes ago. Yep, I think we did. And a fixed resistor is not adjustable. It's fixed, so mm -hmm. we know it's not that. A power resistor... What the heck is that even? Yeah, well, it's that one with the heat sink on it that we looked at earlier. Oh, is that what they call yeah, it? Yeah, it's a bit. We're, we're going to look at some power resistors here in just a minute. Um, it's not a transformer. I mean, you, well, I guess there are auto transformers that you can adjust, but that's not what's used for volume control. It's going to be C, a potentiometer. And everyone had that right over here in the chat room. So, yep. uh, that's... That's a, a pretty good one there. You know, potentiometer is one of my favorite things. One of my favorite things. It has components. a lot of potential. It does. Or a lot less potential, depending on which way you turn it. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're pretty neat. <laughs> well, I'm just I'm, saying, I, remember. I don't know why it just is. Yeah, I know you've used them a lot because I've seen some of the gear you've modified up there and, and put them on. I've been through a lot of potentiometers in my life. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you've got anything in here that hadn't been modified, and half of them have got potentiometers on them, yep. whether they needed them or not. <laughs> okay, next question here. What electrical parameter is controlled by a potentiometer? A, inductance. B, resistance. C, capacitance. Or D, field strength. And we we just went through that uh Potentiometer is basically a variable resistor, so it's going to be B, resistance. Okay. Um, it's not going to change the inductance or capacitance, and certainly not the field strength. Not unless it was wired to a transmitter and it was changing the power. Or it was the RF gain. Well, no, that wouldn't change the field strength. That just would change the receive strength. Yeah, I'll grow with you, B. <laughs> <laughs> and there we go, resistance. Okay. You know, we're, I think we're on a roll again because we were had D's. Oh, there was a C in there, but there's been quite a few B's this last run. Yeah. Yep. 
Okay, and I think this is our final question tonight, Tommy. Okay. What instrument is used to measure resistance? A, an oscilloscope. B, a spectrum analyzer. C, a noise bridge. Or D, an ohm meter. Um, <laughs> well, I know it's not an oscilloscope because I was measuring resistors before I even owned an oscilloscope. Yeah. All right. I know it's not a spectrum analyzer. That would be a mighty expensive instrument to use just to check for the low five, resistor. For a five cent resistor? Yep. It's not a noise bridge. It's just an ohm meter. Uh, the unit of resistance is the ohm, so it would make sense an ohm meter is, mm -hmm. is what you would use for it. And everybody got that in the chat room over here, and I'm, I'm proud of every last one of them because if somebody would have missed that one, I'd, I would uh, have to look at them over my glasses. Well, 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 somebody don't could say miss that. It, because know? see, anybody that that hasn't been around any of that stuff, like when my wife was getting her ticket, she she would have had no idea without well, that's reading true. and studying that. So, but I mean, that's it's a valid question. But you could have come out of the deal with a nice spectrum analyzer. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to have one. Yeah, probably yeah. Be like that oscilloscope. I, I haven't bought yet, but I, I would, probably wouldn't. I would like you to have one, too, when you get yeah. your 3D printer. Just yeah. go ahead I'll, and... I'll make one. I'll yeah. print one. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> On the 15th of each month, ICOM is proud to sponsor AmateurLogic.tv with host George Thomas, Tommy Martin, and Peter Barrett. This looks a little crude, but roughly here's what I have. The bottom trace here is ground. While the elements will jiggle some, they're actually not too bad. It's light. After putting it together, I decided to test everything, so I ran in 12 volts, and I'm measuring the output here. No, it's not too windy right now, Jim. It was yesterday. Actually turn that into a scanner capable of tuning across a wide range of frequencies. Whoa, okay. What is this called? We're in the antenna switching matrix. Any one of our six broadcast transmitters could be connected to any of the 22 antennas via the switching matrix. Down in Melbourne, apparently they, they tune up their radios <laughs> different than we do, Tommy. Oh yeah? Now the FM 900 is tough. Seriously tough. <laughs> we finally arrived. Man, we are in Ham Nirvana. Again. Boy, what, what a great time. And, and as happened last year, we still haven't got all the way through the flea market yet. No, we've been hit about a fourth of it, but we're going to have to strike a trot. Well, the moment of truth has arrived. I've attached a BNC connector to the antenna terminals here. I've got plus 12 volt in ground uh, power coming in here. It's going to my uh, power supply. Uh, that I'm supplying it with 13.8 volts. And I personally am so thrilled that... George got the special award. Well deserved, my friend. That's really cool. Yeah, what about the Super Bowl, Emil? Did you go to the Super Bowl, or were you at home uh, operating that night? Tuning my amplifier, and oh, I lost power in the shack, and uh, went outside. The house lost power. <laughs> the whole neighborhood went out for about yeah. 30 minutes. I, I don't know what happened. Oh, huh. that explains a lot. All right, Tommy, sing the theme song here. We've got ohm meters. We've got a box of goodies here. Box so. of homage. Homage, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're good to go. Let's talk about some of these resistors. Let's look at some of them that, that you brought up this time around. How do you like that one, Tommy? Man, I like that one a lot. Let's look at it a little closer. This is uh, red, red, orange, and silver. Mm -hmm. I don't. What was red? Two. Yep. Two, two. And then orange was three. Twenty-two k. Twenty-one point seven. Mm-hmm. And I think if you took twenty-two thousand and multiplied it times point one. We would find out that we were within 10%. Oh, yeah. Since this is a silver resistor, anywhere plus or minus 10% of that value means the resistor is good. 
Now this is one of the older ones here. You see this one's got the uh, the kind of uh, brown body to it. That's an old carbon composition resistor. You don't see those as often today. I just happen to have a number of them though. But this used to be the the most popular type of resistors that you would find. Now let's uh, let's look at some others here. Here's a little more modern one. This is a carbon film resistor. That's a Radio Shack special. Yep. We see a lot like this these there days. Is. It's smaller. I think this is probably a one eighth watt resistor. Wow. That's the, microscopic. The man. first one we had looked at was a. Uh, this is a quarter watt resistor. The old carbon composition. So you can see as the wattage goes down, the resistor gets smaller. Are you sure um, there's something there? There is something there. <laughs> I'm not even going to try to tell you the colors on this oh, one. Oh, come on. But I'm just going to just, uh, let's see, maybe measure it my fingers here. How's it feels it like a 10K to me. Does let's, it? Let's see. So a lot. Of, that's a lot of ohms packed into a small package. It is. 9.96. Look at this one. I mean, it almost looks like a uh, a centipede. What do you think about that, Tommy? Oh yeah, yeah, that's pretty different. It's kind of unusual. This is called a SIP resistor. What it is, it's a number of resistors in one package. There, if we did a little measuring, uh, we'd find that uh, th they, they could be wired different ways. Yeah, if we measure here, four point seven. Go down the next pair, 4.7. The next pair is another 4.7. Some of these are wired. Each resistor is tied to one leg on the end. This particular one, they're in pairs. Or okay, or I, thought the, or, I thought the value multiplied as you went down. No. Mm -mm. They're all the same value. You said something about a power resistor? Yeah. Look at that. That's a 50 ohm. 10 watt resistor 10 percent tolerance 10 percent tolerance it's no no guesswork on this one that baby's got it printed right there on it there we go and flip around you can see the leads that are coming out the ends there they're just kind of folded over but that's a ceramic resistor right there it's wire wound so although it's a 50 ohm resistor it wouldn't make a good dummy load because being wire wound means that it's going to have some inductance to it as well. Oh, yeah. So, but it'll take 10 watts, and it's in a ceramic package here. There can be other power resistors like the one you showed us in a heat sink. Uh, there can, I mean, there there can be huge power resistors, much, much bigger than this. Got some in a, a broadcast dummy load, you know, resistors, you know, probably about that long, and probably a dozen of them in there. Oh, wow. So, yeah. They can, they can get pretty big. Now, I don't have a rheostat, unfortunately, Man. but, you know. It's pretty hard to come by from what I understand. Yeah. Well, we could cut one of the legs off this potentiometer and we'd have one. <laughs> <laughs> but we're not going to do that. Let's, let's well, look at some potentiometers. Okay. Here's a typical potentiometer. This one right here is, uh, happens to be a 3 mag ohm. It's, uh, you know, exactly what we talked about earlier. It's a resistor in there. You can see it's got three leads on it. The wiper is the one in the center. And as we turn this, it just moves that wiper back and forth across the resistor. That's, uh, so there's one there. You want to measure it? Uh, we'll measure one in a minute. Okay. Uh, here's another one here. It's got a very short shaft. And there's a slot cut in the middle of it. This one's made yeah, to be yeah, adjusted adjust with a screwdriver. screwdriver. And that's a real expensive one there. But not because of the screwdriver thing. That's just a, an expensive Yeah, uh, where'd that come out of? That came out of some video gear, and I can't remember exactly what. Here's another one here. This one is what I'd call a dual gain potentiometer. There's actually two potentiometers in here. You see we got two rows of three. And when we turn this... It's adjusting both of those in parallel with each other. They're not con physically connected together. It's just two independent potentiometers, but mechanically they track each other. 
I've got more potentiometers to go yet. Here's another one here. This one, a potentiometer, we got our three leads there. But on the back of it here, there's there's four more leads. This is one of those that's went to like a radio. If you listen to this when I turn it. Mm -hmm. This one's got a switch built into it. So it's a potentiometer along with an on-off switch and it just happens it's probably a double pole single throw switch there and that's how we turn on and off our radio yeah looks like come out of a car radio or something speaking of car radio here's one that came out of it's a almost car like radio. a setup it is and you didn't even know it was coming did you? no i didn't this one right here there's four different potentiometers mounted on this shaft and on the back of it there is a switch it's a push on push off switch this may have come out of an 8 track tape player type of uh, radio because hmm. it, it looks like it's momentary but when we yeah, turn that's this how you change the track no there we go hear the click yeah it's a turn it on or off but it also, there's a function when you push change, in on it. Change the track. Change the track on your 8-track tape player. There's also an outer shaft around here. The way this one works, when you turn this one, the shaft here, coming out the end, it's going to adjust two of these pots. When you turn the one inside there, which was typically maybe a balance control or a tone control, mm -hmm. it's going to adjust the other two pots. So okay. there you go, a four-game pot out of a... That kind of brings back a bunch of old right memories, there. man. You ever tear up a radio and find one of those in there? No, but I've used a lot of them before. There you go. You usually, usually deal with the business end. Right? Yeah. Okay. I got more yet. This but one. But wait, there's more. Yes. This one is a 5K, and I know that because I wrote 5K on the end of it. Obviously, I uh, checked it at some point. It is a PC board mounted potentiometer, or we might call it a trimmer pot. There's two leads here on the end, and then these tabs coming out the middle are the wiper. And you just turn it like that. There's even a screwdriver slot in it. You'd see this maybe on the back of a TV set where you stuck a screwdriver through there to turn it. Mm -hmm. That's typically what, what you'd find in there. Here's another one. This is just uh, another potentiometer, but it just happens to be real small. Just a regular pot. And then this one here, it's a 1K ohm. I know that because I wrote it on there. Oh, yes. We see our three legs. PC board through hole. There's a little screw here. Yeah, I've got on some the of, end of it. This is a multi turn pot. It's probably 10 or 20 turns. So it's high precision. You know, it's from one end to the other, you got to turn that thing 10 times. So you can get real precise when you're adjusting your yeah, resistance. Yeah, let's see, that one looks like a 1K. It does look like a 1K, doesn't it? Let's see what the audience thinks. <laughs> <laughs> let's measure a potentiometer now. Although it's two potentiometers in here. Uh, let's see if we can measure that. There we go. Good, smooth action there as we turn it. There's all the way one direction is zero ohms. Go all the way the other direction, and it's going to be the same value as if we were just measuring across the end. Now, we can measure from either end to the wiper there, and we're going to get the same result. It's just you turn the shaft backwards mm -hmm. from the other way. So there we go. Uh, potentiometer. This would be used for volume control. You know, I should have uh, probably had something prepared that we could look at one of these in a circuit and, and see actually how it was wired. Yeah, maybe we'll do that uh, future. That sounds like a good topic for the future. Mm -hmm. That's all that's in my little box here. So I guess it's time for us to do the next thing. Yep. Now we're celebrating the 10th anniversary over at Amateur Logic, and we want you to be a part of it. We're giving away some great prizes. It's going to be this ICOM IC7410 HF and 6 meter rig, which, boy, a great rig, one I recommend 
a lot when people ask me what kind of HF rig should I get. Yeah, that's a good one. We actually had one of these on the show uh, a few years back. Yeah. Had one at the house for a while playing around with it. It's pretty nice. Yep. I well, hated to give it back. I know you did. Uh, we're also going to give away an MFJ 4245 MV adjustable voltage switching power supply that is 12 volts DC, actually 13.8, which is what we want typically for our ham rigs, but it's a variable, so it'll go a little up or down from that, but 40 amps continuous. You know, that's plenty to drive this radio or most HF radios. Oh yeah, and then, and then some stuff. And Yep. And we're also, we're going to give an antenna away with this, a 40 meter off center fed uh, dipole from MFJ. And they're going to throw in a hundred foot of coax to go with it too. So awesome! it's going to be a complete ham radio setup. This radio already has an auto tuner built in it, doesn't it, Tommy? Yeah, I believe it. Well, you know what? I really don't, I don't remember. Does it? If I look at the sheet of paper here, built-in voice synthesizer, voice squelch control, two preamp types, built-in automatic antenna tuner. Yeah, I was correct. Uh, it's, yeah, what, what can I say about it? It's a great HF rig. It's not the bottom of the line in ICOM's product line. It's up just a little bit from that, mm -hmm. but boy, this radio, I, I've always been impressed with it every time. Yeah, I couldn't remember about the tuner, but I, you know what stands out to me when I had it at the house? The DSP on it, it, was, it was amazing. Well, you know, I, I have an IC7700. That's my personal HF rig. This one sounds so much like it. I yeah. mean, and, and there's a pretty wide price differentiation, but the same engineers made the DSP for this mm -hmm. radio that made it for ICOM's flagship radio yeah, as well. Yeah, that I, ICOM DSP is it, really outstanding. The yeah. audio quality is so great. This one also has a USB port on it, which is um, something several of their rigs have, but mm -hmm. It's really handy for remote operation. You can use the RSBA1 software and remotely control it do, over the internet. Digital modes. Do digital by, modes. You just with install it. the USB driver that's free off the ICOM mm -hmm. site, and, and uh, you can do digital modes with, without any extra hardware. Mm -hmm. So it's essentially like a computer sound card built in to the rig. Yep. So you don't have to use a rig runner or or any of those external interfaces. Mm -hmm. Just a, a USB cable. Uh, great HF rig. We want you to, to go over uh, and enter the contest. You can find all the directions on how to do that at amateurlogic.tv slash contest. Mm -hmm. uh, you do need to be a licensed ham radio operator, so go to that address. Uh, check out the rules. Uh, the drawing is going to be open to U.S. and Canadian amateurs only. Sorry about that. Yeah, and only one entry per ham, too, please. Right, only one entry. But all the details are at amateurlogic.tv slash contest. Go check them out. If you haven't entered yet, go enter because someone's going to win it. It might as well be you. Yeah, somebody's going to join in the celebration, a 10 year 10 year celebration. celebration. It's hard to believe it's been 10 years. It is hard to believe it's been 10 years. And. Uh, we still, we don't know exactly what we're going to do. You said we can't have champagne. Yeah. Well, we can have, I mean, we know kind of what we're going to do. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> it's a top secret. I'm not going I'm not going to let the cat out of the bag. No, I'm not Because the dogs either. out there would go crazy, yeah. apparently. But I think it's going to be something fun. 73, thanks so, for joining so, us. 73, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks for the Amateur Logic 10th anniversary show. Yeah. Going to be a big time. Repeater. You don't really expect me to see that from here, do you? <laughs> <laughs>
I thought you brought your spectacles in. <laughs> Those only work from about this far. Resistance is re re futile. It is. <laughs> Speaking of half colorblind, I notice that battery is running down quicker than I thought it would. Nothing to do with color blindness, or is it? No. You got 80, you got to start talking fast, man. Yeah, you know, it looks like we're looking at the audience when we <laughs> do that. I see you. Hey, man, we, we need to stop. we got a problem. Look at, look at the shirts. Yeah, I just noticed that. We look like we're getting beamed up. But that's not all of our questions, and I'm not sure. You mean we have more fun? We have more fun. If I can, uh, I can't find my sheet of paper. 